hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com this is a live Facebook stream let me bore you to sleep number seven zero and I'm here with my little boy Andre Say hello to everyone. Hey. So if you're listening to this on a podcast, I do recommend you joining. I'm going to turn my laptop off. I do recommend having a look on YouTube and uh, checking out the video so you can see little Andre he's actually quite tired I think I'm just gonna hold him move the camera down a bit so you can see him there you go try not to bang the microphone with my beard Oh, look at him. Are you tired? Are you tired? He's been a very good boy today. Haven't you? Yes. I didn't put him in his cage last night or during the day when I was asleep. And he didn't bother me, didn't do anything, he just let me sleep. You're a good boy, aren't you? Yes, look. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> so, only listen to this or watch this video when you can safely close your eyes because I will be talking for maybe an hour about stuff and it's supposed to be boring and I will start in a minute Andre's just having a little look around. Gonna bite my finger. He's gonna love a little nibble on my fingers. He's gonna wanna get down in a minute. Yeah. Corrine, hi Corrine. He is a sweetheart, isn't he? Got a lot of trust in me as well. I can hold him at all different angles and he knows he's safe. He wants to get down now, so I better let him get down. Sometimes I hold on to him, and I don't know what he wants to get down for. You know, he might want to get down because he needs to go to the toilet or something, so I need to try and be aware of that. Anyway, let me put the camera up a little bit. That's better. That's too far, I'm down a little bit. Right, I think my head needs to be kind of near the top, but not too near the top. And I just realized I didn't check my mouth because I've just been eating some ice cream. So hopefully I haven't got too much ice cream all over around my mouth. So, just drinking a can of Coke. There's only a little bit left in there, so I'll just make that last. And Andre's decided to play in a bag. So I wonder how, who, if I can invite people. 
Who could I invite? Uh, I could invite uh, just a few people that might be interested in joining, although quite a few of those might be in bed now. guessing if the invites are up it means that people are on Facebook they're actually online there's a few people that have joined me in the past so yeah I just invite a little handful of people see if anybody wants to come on Here in the background, Andre's decided to start moving stuff around and basically just being naughty. That's enough for now, I think. Okay. So Cassie Carter's just joined. Hello, Cassie. I enjoy, I just enjoyed you I just enjoyed you I just joined or asked you if you wanted to join do you want to see what Andre's up to I'm going to put, let you have a look there you go has to knock stuff off the floor. Not off the floor, onto the floor. So if something's on a flat surface, he seems to have this urge to knock whatever's on the flat surface off of the flat surface. So I brought this jigsaw puzzle. Um, I'm not sure what day it was. It wasn't yesterday. It wasn't. I think it was before Christmas. I bought this jigsaw puzzle, and so I got a jigsaw puzzle and a lava lamp at the same time. I think it was from Argos. The idea behind it was that I was going to first of all I was going to have the lava lamp and film it and use that lava lamp for uh, so like let's say if I do an, an audio I record an audio and then I can edit it and add it to a video that I've already made which would be of the lava lamp which I have done I've actually recorded some of the lava lamp footage so like an hour or something I also bought this jigsaw puzzle this isn't the whole thing this is just part of the jigsaw puzzle that I'm holding in my hand it's actually um, it's the bottom right hand side of the picture So, and the idea I thought, I thought, you know what? When I do ASMR stuff, like whispering, they're usually fairly popular. Even if I do have Andre running around while I'm trying to make the videos and He's still doing it. Why? Andre. He's suddenly got all this energy and he wants to... He's going to start scratching at the carpet now. 
See, I can tell when he's going to have to do something. So I thought maybe if I made a jigsaw puzzle whilst whispering, have the camera focused on the jigsaw puzzle. And the jigsaw puzzle I got, it was four puzzles in one. And it was all from the, um, the Avengers Infinity War. So I started to do this jigsaw puzzle. And there's only a hundred pieces, so it's a small jigsaw puzzle. Haven't done, uh, haven't done anything like this since I was a kid. And I was so bored. I was doing it, thinking that, you know, I thought this is a great idea. I can whisper about the jigsaw puzzle and I can whisper about you know, previous times I've done a jigsaw puzzle and all that stuff and actually it turned into the most boring video that I've probably ever made. But too boring even for me. Plus I was trying to focus on the jigsaw puzzle. If that makes sense. I was trying to sort of and I was really aware and I was also I think I recorded it live, or I streamed it live, I think. So I had no way of editing. And it's at one point I wanted to just chuck the jigsaw puzzle on the floor. Although if you look on the floor, there are about 20 pieces. Now I'm aware that the microphone keeps being bashed by my beard. So I'm going to move the microphone down. Hopefully it won't make too much noise. Tell me if it does. Forgive me. Just about to move it. Move it. Oops. Move it a little bit further down. Because my beard is scraping on it. Okay, so the, the microphone's now there. You should still be able to hear me because it's it's not far from my mouth. It's probably so I don't know what's that about. It's got to be a good what twelve inches. So it's probably about twelve, thirteen inches from my mouth. Yeah, and so it should be fine. And there's not a lot of difference between where it is now to where it was before. Oh, my neck's a bit stiff. Sometime before I start doing these let me bore you to sleep sessions, I do wonder what should I talk about? What would be a good conversation to have? And then I remember that it's not supposed to be a good conversation. First of all, it's not a conversation anyway. It's, uh, what's that word you call when someone just talks at you? A monologue. So it's kind of like a monologue, but an unrehearsed monologue something where you don't know what I'm going to say or but I don't know what I'm going to say either and that's kind of part of the charm Andre's just come into the room and he's looked at me like he knows something that I don't know and he's gone and hidden under the chair so I think he's just done something a bit naughty he doesn't normally do that it looks like he's hiding from me. I wonder what he's done. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So he's come into the room. He's looked at me, looked up at me, looked down, 
and run around and went straight underneath the black chair. Now he's come out again. And now I think he's deciding to It's like he's not quite sure what he's going to do. He wants to do something, but he doesn't quite know what. He probably wants my attention, but not too much of my attention because he probably doesn't want me bothering him too much because he likes to just get on with his own stuff. I'm just watching him, I don't know. I'm not sure what he's up to. Because sometimes you get something in his mind and it's as if he's just gonna he's gonna do it. But he's quite sneaky with it. Yeah, I'm watching him. If I catch him doing anything a bit unusual I might let you f see him do it I might turn the camera around but this jigsaw puzzle I really just I think my jigsaw career is over and I think it's I think what I'm going to do is pack it up and either just stick it in the cupboard Maybe, maybe do the jigsaw puzzle in 20 years, I might want to do it then. Or give it to the charity shop, I'm not sure. But then if I give it to the charity shop, I've got to walk, or I've got to travel to the charity shop. I don't know why he's, Andre's doing what he's doing. He's like, okay, how can I make a bit of noise? How, Daddy's filming now. He likes it to be quiet when he films. What can I do to just wind him up? I think that's, that's what's going through his head. He's been quiet for hours and now suddenly, running around. It's, you know, it's, it's nearly three o'clock in the morning. I think it is anyway. So, not really done much today as far as, well, I have and I haven't. So I watched a bit of telly, but I have, this is the third recording that I've made. The th See, I'm trying to do this like really relaxing sleep session while I'm talking. And he, I'll let you see exactly what he's doing. See, he's up to something. I don't know what. That's all his toys over there. Oh, now he's going away. Now he's decided to go to sleep. <laughs> he's a bit sham, shamra cry. He's a bit camera shy. So hello to John, who's watching, and James. Andre's not a big fan of being filmed. Sometimes when I, he's doing something and I, and I start filming him, and he'll stop straight away and just run off. Like just then, as soon as I pointed the camera at him, he's into his bed and he's gone to sleep. Go figure.
So I suppose it's always, it's rare that these let me bore you to sleep are completely quiet because if they were completely quiet, then I wouldn't be talking, would I? And then there'd be no point. There'd just be the sound of the fridge in the background, but even that's not quiet, that's still sound. I wonder why fridges make that noise. And I wonder why do some more things like lawn mowers. Why are lawn mowers so noisy? I'd have thought by now that there'd be lawn mowers that were just really quiet. I've never heard a quiet lawnmower ever and I'll admit I've not done in-depth research into lawnmowers and the volumes of individual you know species um, of lawnmower They all seem to be fairly noisy. I'm just thinking back to, yeah, even when I used to do the lawn mowing. So when I was living at home with my parents, when my dad used to get me to mow the lawn, and we had like fairly, I suppose, a fairly big garden. I don't even remember if it was an electric one or not. It might be one of those ones, like a rotary one, you know, where you push it and then the, the thing turns around and cuts the grass that way. Which was kind of quite similar to the, the manual vacuum cleaners, you know, in the past where you, they used to sort of operate by turning the wheels as opposed to being connected to an electricity circuit like via a plug into the socket um, which most vacuum cleaners I guess are these days but or have been for a long time but then now you've got like Dyson vacuums and other ones that are kind of similar and they're hands free not hands free unless you know how to use your feet really well. But then you'd probably have to stand on your hands, wouldn't you? But they're, they're kind of cordless, that's what I mean, cord free. But then everything's kind of wireless these days. This is wireless, the internet is wireless. I watch television and although Technically, it's not wireless, is it? Because even wireless has to be connected by a wire. Because you can't have wireless without it being connected to a hub, which is connected to electricity. So it's not really wireless. Something has to, there has, there's a wire at some point in that particular journey from getting from the um, I don't know, the mother, the womb of uh, internet broadband to the television set which plays Netflix as an example I was watching Netflix recently and uh, is, uh, there was this show on there which was I forget what it's called, Mirror Mirror or Dark Mirror or something like that. And it was, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And it was, you could choose what happens within the show. So it got to a point and it says, do you want him to, this is just an example, do you want uh, Todd to 
have a cup of tea or go skydiving. You know, as an example, that wasn't in the script, but it just gives you, and then you can sort of choose which one you want. And then the, it's like a role play, like those role play books when I was a kid. I never played the role play games, computer games, because I've never really played computer games. So I don't, I'm kind of a little behind the times with that stuff. Although, I remember when Tron was out, you know, the original Tron in the 80s, and I used to go down the arcade. Because where I used to live, there used to be three arcades. Because I lived, I lived in a sunside, a sun, sun, a seaside town. It's a lovely little town, actually. Um, if you removed all the people, it'd be lovely. No, it'd be, it's a nice little place, and I there used to be an arcade opposite the pier I can't remember what it's called now but I used to know what it was called because I used to go there and it used to be a mixture of you know like penny games you know where you put the pennies in and uh, it goes down a loop and then it pushes stuff out and uh, just different kind of little games and uh, slot machines and things like that and then it'd be computer games, ones that you could sit in and do racing, and, um, and other ones like Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and things like that. And then things started to get a bit more progressive and a bit more technologically advanced with, you know, Tron and, uh, you know, I didn't really progress with it. And uh, opposite that arcade, because I say, you used to, there used to be two hills you used to be able to come down. One was called Bent Hill, and the other one was, I don't remember the name of that hill, but they weren't that far apart from each other. So Bent Hill came directly from the town center. And to the right of that was the Spa Gardens. And, but Bent Hill, it came, it was quite a twirly hill, twirly. And I remember I, I used to travel down there on a bus, you know, loads and loads and loads of times over the years when I was young. And it used to be a little bit of a thrill ride, a little bit of a a journey, you know, a bit of oh. If it overlapped, we could end up in the sea or on the beach, which was uh, wasn't really that exciting. But when it was windy, though. Sometimes we'd try and go down and we'd get blown back up the hill. And when it was winter, if it was snowing, people used to slide down it on, you know, slidey things, sleighs, or is it sleighs, sledges? And, uh, but then it would be quite difficult to stop, so people did end up on the beach. So that was, uh, good fun to watch so so Bent Hill would that be the, the town so I'll give you a better example so if you come out of the the train station just a little train station it didn't used to be now really you walk through the train station you get off and opposite and there's a there's a uh, a fire station, you know, um, fire, not place where you buy fires, um, like a fire brigade kind of place. So that's kind of on your left. 
and as you walk straight ahead there's the supermarket I don't know what it's called but that didn't used to be there so when I was younger that wasn't there all it was there was basically like a little forest like a little I'm not going to say magical forest because I don't remember much magic occurring but it was like a bit of waste ground I used to walk through the waste ground to get to the platform for the train and the, the platform didn't even look like it was a proper pl train platform it was just in the middle of nowhere in the middle of this waste ground but it's not waste ground anymore there's a, a big quite a big car park really they could there's probably room to do more stuff on there if they wanted to but there's a, a DIY store things like, like a home base or something like that and there's uh, the supermarket see that supermarket I was a cleaner there I think two or three times in my earlier years before before the age of 20 or 19 or 20 something like that I worked there as a cleaner early mornings I also had a cleaning job there so I was doing the cleaning so I'd go in there in the morning about I don't know six six in the morning until about eight so we'd do the do the floors so we'd walk up with the the sweepy stuff there's these big long um, like fluffy things that were flat and they weren't quite wide enough or long enough to fill um, between each of the uh, aisles but they were just enough so you could maneuver them to sort of go in and out and they wouldn't necessarily go underneath the aisles because you don't really want to go under there because there's stuff going to be the stuff there from years ago that you don't perhaps want to find like false teeth and wooden legs who knows that other I don't know but just forgotten maybe money I didn't think about that so go up and down and collect all the dust and whatever bits like that to be doing that and then after that there'd be we get the mop and we'd mop all the way up and down then we get the buffer the buffer machine and buff up and down so basically uh, make the the floor really nice and clean and shiny and looking nice and smelling nice as well I guess I never really used to smell it didn't used to get that close to the floor but it looked nice very clean and I had the job there at different times of the year as well so there were times I had the job there in the summer I think in 19 19 89 I think yeah I think in 1989 early summer I had a job working there in the mornings because I was living opposite so it's quite easy for me just to get to work and uh, plus I didn't have any income that's the only money I had so that Fifteen pound a week or whatever I was earning was all the money I had, which was you know needed. But I might have had a part-time job in the evening as well because 
I think in the cleaning world it's a little bit like the it's a bit like how uh, rich people are you know in the music industry entertainment industry uh, you know it's who you know so so once I had the job in the cleaning the cleaning at the supermarket I got to know other people well people working there that also had jobs doing evening cleaning or maybe you know do other cleaning jobs some people did it all day um, but some people because I lived in a place where the docks we had docks so there's lots of offices and lots of office cleaning jobs so I had lots of different jobs doing that over the years and I'll always remember it's quite of a weird memory really but I had this job just before I moved to London I, I went back to cleaning office cleaning and it was uh, yeah I didn't have a I didn't have a job so this was during Christmas time during the winter 1990 I didn't have any money coming in I didn't have any job uh, like a full-time job or anything so I didn't sign on so I didn't have any benefits coming in so what I did is I earned just enough to get by by doing early morning cleaning job and an evening cleaning job and between the two and I might have had maybe a weekend cleaning job as well I, f I forget I can't remember but between those jobs I kind of got by you know and I had this one job it was in on the docks and I used to be able to walk to it because it was not I, it was like around the corner from where my dad lived and then down an alleyway and just walking through and the the office block that I was cleaning with a bunch of other people as well was really just at the beginning of the docks so you didn't have to go right into the docks to get to the office block so it's easily to get easy to get there by walking but I had other office jobs like office cleaning jobs on the docks where I had to get picked up and taken in a minivan because you know because of the security and because it was so so it kept them to be taken to different places um, so I had that also I had a yeah I met a few friends doing that actually and then I had a, a cleaning job in the offices down the docks in the mornings as well at some point I've, I don't know how old I was again it might have been 1989 1990 I lose track so I did lots and lots of different cleaning jobs during that time and I preferred I, I did like well I say like I use the word very uh, very flippantly but I feel quite fondly towards the supermarket cleaning job that I had because it was 1990 and it was Christmas it was the end of the year so I don't know how many months I was working there so probably maybe October November December and I was there every morning apart from Sunday I don't think in them days shops didn't open on Sundays uh, but things have changed now they used to 
the shopping opening times were a lot different in the 80s and uh, even early 90s to what they are now in England because there was a time where you could only because I used to work in a supermarket I used to work in a co-op when I was 17 yeah, I worked in a co-op full time and I've been working for full time for three, two years already before I started that job. And so I started that job in the April in the co-op 1988. And previous to that, I'd worked in a chip shop for two years from the April 1986 when I was still 15 but I wasn't 16 until the end of August that year so I'd already been working full time for two years and I don't know why I remember this but the person that interviewed me for the co-op job and it's, it's this little 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 shop this wasn't little, I wasn't tiny. I mean, you could, you could get inside it, you know, it was human size door, but it wasn't like a big, big supermarket. It was more, I suppose you could say it's probably bigger than a corner shop, but not by much, you know? And so I worked there. And I remember the interview, I think it was with a man called Mr. Cook. So I had the interview and at the end of the interview, he said to me, do you have any questions? And I said, yes. When do I start? And that was pretty much I think that was my first ever job interview, like proper job interview, because when I worked at the chip shop, yeah, when I worked at the chip shop, I just, just said, yeah, I want a job, and they said, all right, then, give you a trial. Uh, here's how you fry chips. And then I progressed and I did, I learned a lot actually about different things, but I never had to really sort of jump through hoops, you know, sort of job interviews or anything like that. And it was, a, I was kind of being a bit cocky really, a bit, uh, I don't know, a bit cheeky like yeah when do I start and he said oh you can start Monday I said oh okay I don't even know if I wanted the job I suppose I just wanted a job because back then I didn't didn't have any aspirations really it's not totally true there was a time, this might seem hard to believe, there was a time that I fancied myself as a bit of a businessman. Uh, when I was working in a chip shop, I had such a low income that I started doing a bit of selling, a bit of, a bit of dealing, a bit of not, not dodgy dealing really, but a bit of spying and selling, you know, that kind of stuff. That sounded like spying and selling, no, buying and selling. And because I was in a chip shop, I got to meet lots of people, I got to know lots of people, and got to make, you know, make a few acquaintances and, uh, it helped me a bit, you know, helped me get by. And then I started getting into jewellery and I travelled up to 
where is the place in London, not Covent Garden, is it Hatton Garden? And um, I bought a bunch of jewellery that I was going to sell. And uh, I remember, it's, I must have been just somehow kind of a degree of bravery back then because on the train home from London I was actually going up to people on the train trying to sell them jewellery. I didn't know the first thing about selling, I didn't know anything about jewellery really apart from what I'd kind of read up on <laughs> and I nothing really came of it in the end also got into perfume I was going to sell perfume and I got loads of samples from manufacturers and the idea is you know I've got a big case and people smell it and then they say yeah I left some of that and probably a bit like Avon I suppose um, and But again, nothing really came of that either. But I did give them a little go. Always kind of like the idea of being a, a salesperson, you know, a proper, a proper, but like, it's in my mind, it seemed like an exciting lifestyle. And, you know, even in 1995, 1996, uh, I was reading sales books on how to sell. It's actually, in fact, I became a canvasser for double glazing windows back in 1988. And I did that for a while. Was it 88 or 89? Probably 89. And that was one of the that was one of the highlights really of my life at the time because I was suddenly earning quite good money. I was winning prizes because I was although I wasn't selling, I was selling the idea and I was you know I was um, getting sales people into houses to, you know, demonstrate the double glazing. So suddenly I was knocking on people's doors and just talking absolute rubbish at them. And I thought, you know what? If I can do this and be fairly successful at it just by talking rubbish, imagine what I'd be like if I could actually had some sales skills, if I actually knew what I was talking about, knew what I was doing or why I was doing it. So I started reading sales books, like proper how to be a salesperson. Um, and I, you know, I continue to read those kind of books for years and years and years, and then I got pretty much throughout the whole of the 90s, I kind of got a bit stuck in this um, increasingly rubbish jobs at times. I still had this little idea in my mind that I could sell, that I, that I could do it. And I did test it a few times when I was in London. I got probably three, maybe four sales jobs, but they were commission only. So I, because I had no money coming in, I couldn't only do it for a few days and then I had to go back to work because I couldn't. I couldn't give it everything, you know.
and then I was forced into a job. Um, I won't go into details, but I was kind of forced back into um, to go for an interview for a job in 2001. And I didn't want to go for it. But I was on this scheme that was run by Reed that the government put me on because I'd been unemployed for a little while. And the job I was interested in was uh, making computers. So that interested me because I was very much interested in computers and I thought, well, this could be a really good skill for me to learn and to do, but then that position was gone and I was sent to an interview at a call centre selling mobile phone contracts and I got the job I think pretty much anyone that would have turned up would have got the job but it was a salary so it was you know it was a, a wage plus commission And it turned out that I was really good at it. And it was cold calling, which is what I'd always done before, but never been paid before. Never had a chance to actually um, take my time and kind of learn what I was doing. So that was kind of weird. I liked it and I didn't like it, it was a mixture, there was lots of people there, the turnover was quite high, but there was lots of young people, the energy was really good, really, it's quite a nice energy, got on quite well with most people. Um, within probably two weeks or three weeks of me being there, I was, pretty much top of the board of the sales which was really cool because they didn't realize that I was any good because the top salesperson and quite a few other people were getting more sales than me where people were saying yes on the phone but then they would phone the people back or the people would send the phone back and they didn't want it my conversion rate was much higher than everybody else's. So although I wasn't selling as much as anyone else, not as anyone, as, as the top people, hardly any of my phones got sent back. So people, so my conversion rate was high. So I ended up being like either number one or number two on the board. And everyone was, even the managers were like, who is this bloke? How are you doing what you're doing? I said, well, I just don't know. I kind of didn't know, but I think the something about learning about selling for all those years maybe prepared me for talking to people on the phones and to you know do that so then I ended up getting a job in insurance selling ins selling car insurance and it was quite weird because the person who interviewed me he told me later that he wasn't even going to give me the job because of my age and I was 31 at the time they wanted young people, younger people. And again, they had a big leaderboard on the wall and I was, I was nowhere to be seen. And I started in September and I said to them before I started, it will take me a while. It'll take me a while, it's a new thing, I need to learn the product. I don't like to, I just, make it up although I do like to make things up but you know I'd like to 
learn the craft, learn the product, and then then you'll see I'll be at the top. I'll be one of the top people. And I promised them. I said it'll take, take a few months though. So I started at the end of September. In fact, it was September the 10th, 2001, I started. And then didn't sell much in October, didn't sell much in November, didn't sell much in December, started to pick up in January, a bit more in February, then April, I was a top. May, I was at the top either first or second, June, July, August, September, October, the same. And then for the whole time I was there, I was at the top, in the top two or three. So that was quite nice. It was quite nice feeling that I was good at something but it wasn't, I think uh, going back to when I was younger, I probably would have preferred to be selling bigger ticket products, you know, something like a, a yacht, you know, or a luxury apartment, something where I'd be earning, you know, maybe a couple of hundred grand on the sale rather than seven pound. You know, I think I'd have been uh, better suited for that kind of thing. But I just never knew how to get my foot into the into the door of that kind of selling. Because I can't drive, so I'm not really cut out for selling cars. You can't really just say, well, go and take the car for a test drive. But I would learn about the product, you know. It's, it's like a job interview. Please give me a job. I'd like to sell, if I did sales, I'd like to do it for something big. Sell something worth millions, you know, perhaps. To me, that's it's interesting. Here's me talking about earning hundreds of thousands of pounds for a sale and how much have I got in the bank? <laughs> so yeah, I think they call that pie in the sky talking. So that hill called Bent Hill used to go all the way down, all the way down the town, leading down Bent Hill. And then you turn right And on the right hand side was Cordy's restaurant. And I used to work there when I was a kid. I used to, I first started working in the evenings and I think maybe weekends, washing up, you know, the dishwasher, because it used to be a really busy restaurant. It used to be upstairs and downstairs, I think. They used to also have like weddings and stuff like that. So I'd, it'd be constant. And it'd always be someone else there with me, which meant it was good. I could have a chat and have a laugh and stuff. And then I progressed to work in the bakehouse, which was basically where they did the baking. You know, the, not bacon as in pork, but, uh, but making cakes and bread and all that stuff. So I used to go in on a Saturday and Sunday morning. I think Saturday was six o'clock in the morning. Sunday was five o'clock. And uh, I'd work till about midday. And I used to never really been you know, a massive morning person. But I liked that job. Might sound strange, and you know, I was earning 
you know, 70 pence an hour or something. But I like the job because, I forget his first name, but Mr. Cordy was the best boss I think I've ever had. But one of the best bosses ever, just because he was so funny. And especially for a kid, he never, he, used to, he told me off sometimes when I was naughty, but not really, doesn't, he was so laid back and easy going. It's really quite nice to be there, actually. And it's quite weird because I ended up working in a huge bakery when I was, how old was I? No, it was 1991. So I was 20 and I got a job in a bakery, like a sun-blessed bakery, I think it was. Huge, massive, massive, massive bakery in Warthamstow in East London. And uh, biggest, biggest place I think I've ever worked, ever. Very different from the bakehouse that I worked in when I was a kid. You know, one of my favorite things ever is, and they wouldn't let me do it until I'd been there a while. My favorite, my favoriteest thing ever was breaking the eggs. Uh, and we're talking, I don't know how many, but dozens and dozens of eggs, breaking them and putting them into a bowl. And then they got mixed in with whatever else. I don't know what they did. Um, but I learned how to break eggs with one hand. I used to be able to break two eggs at a time. And I still got that. Because I broke so many eggs during that time that I learned. And then again, when I was work working in the bakery, some of the jobs I had was standing there for hours breaking eggs into a bowl and because I already had the skills I could do it but it was a lot different then because it was more of a job when I was little when I say little I was 13 it was fun it was just I don't know it was like a a bit of fun really when I was 20 it was probably a bit harder it was a bit more harder work and I was I was probably breaking hundreds of eggs if not more but uh, I remember the eggs were stacked higher than I was <laughs> it was good fun so yeah I just uh, but that was if you go a little bit further down though so that restaurant it's changed a lot now it's I think they sold it and it's now like a brasserie, is that? I don't know if that's right. It sells food, but it's not. It looks a lot smaller now than it used to be. It used to be big. Now it's, I don't know if they've, they've got other stuff, the other side or whatever, but it used to be, you know when you walk into a place and you can see a big old area, now it's not particularly big. I don't know how they manage that. So walking towards the arcade, walk further up. I think there were some houses, because I think down that road, that's where one of my friends lived. Um, Stefan, he lived, I think in one of them houses on the right. Long, long time ago. And, uh, and then there's the other hill, I forget what that's called. And then there was these little gardens as well, which you could look up quite high up. And then keep going and there was, there used to be this shop on the right hand side, which I think it's now a garage or something, or they built some flats there. But this shop it used to sell stamps and like postcards and 
just stuff like old magazines and just really quite rare things and I used to go in there and it used to have the loveliest smell it's I don't know it might seem weird but it's that, that smell of um, love like love for what they had like really seemed to care about what they had in that shop it was more than just a job it was like their hobby as well as their job I don't know how to explain it but um, I used to like going in there and looking at some of the coins and the bits that they had and then just maybe a door or so up because I think it's now a pizza place now but a door up a couple of doors up there was this arcade which was all right I mean at one point probably a few years later upstairs they had like a pool table or a couple a few pool tables so it was a uh, quite snazzy really I don't know what's there now but then across the road there was a pier a pier appeared and then there was um, like an arcade well it wasn't like it it was an arcade but again this is more I don't mean dated in a in a weird way just just more traditional probably uh, mixed with you know newer newer arcade games and then further up if you followed the prom the promenade all the way around at the end there was a place called Mannings and it was an arcade there was an arcade there I think there still might be I don't know if it's called Mannings anymore but Mannings used to be the fairground it used to be a big deal you know when I was about eight nine ten eleven you used to queue up ready for it's probably April time they probably opened it in Easter the you know, beginning of the season and it used to be the biggest deal you know they had a big uh, lots of different um, rides and things like that absolutely loved it there and then underneath that before you got there they also had like candy floss making places and places you could buy ice cream and there still is a place where you can buy chips there I think yeah but I remember back in 1989 I used to there was a place there that had uh, pizzas so they used to like a little it wasn't a Domino's but it was like a little pizza place which is really cool the pizza they're just pretty much always ready just and uh, they just be, it tasted wonderful really nice pizzas but there was this arcade this arcade was really it was quite a big arcade I used to go in there and yeah I remember because there used to be quite a few different things in there again they used to have this like big man what was a puppet like a a puppet thing inside a glass case that used to laugh hysterically yeah <laughs> I know that kind of thing and uh trying to think if you're going so it's quite traditional again yeah I used to enjoy that going in there remember once I went in there and I had uh, a person I think his name was Gary and he used to go he was went to the karate club that I went to and he was working on the ice cream store inside the arcade so basically um, I think it was a summer's evening so the arcade so the the fairground 
he was serving ice creams to people outside but also to people inside the arcade and he gave me and my friend Dean free ice creams and we yeah that was really cool and I remember Dean he left all the ice cream all around his mouth so that he could when he got home he could prove that he'd got a free ice cream Yeah. But I used to play this game called Tron. And just. I, I do, maybe if you're listening to this, you can Google it and see what it is. But I quite like the tune that played whenever I lost. And I got to hear that tune a lot. But you know, it didn't cost a lot of money to play it. It was probably maybe ten pence or twenty pence. But I remember me and my friend we used to just walk there, go to every arcade, go to every game, and just check the slot to see if there was any money, anyone had like left any money in there. And sometimes we'd get lucky and would find, you know, a couple of pound in an evening. The good old days, eh? So that was my experiences of video games. And other stuff. So I thought I'd do a live stream, Let Me Boy to Sleep, on Facebook. Because I did YouTube and... I want to try and do both, but it's, you know, I realise that the timing isn't always perfect, but I can always, you know, you can listen to them or watch them at another time. Don't have to watch or listen to them as they're actually being broadcast. And I will uh, upload this to YouTube and also will. Um, upload the audio as an mp3 to my various podcasts specifically SoundCloud and Spreaker and it'll be available on iTunes and various other places and I'll also upload it uh, to my website jasonnewland.com where you can download it for free and also when you go to the page you can also stream it for free and watch the video for free as well on there so you can stream the video and stream the audio and also download the audio for free if you choose don't want to support you eh? I offer you so much <laughs> so I'm gonna go you take care of yourselves I'll speak to you next time. Bye.